It's Waxing Lyrical, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Lyrical, Mains and Dutch. I'm your host, Mains, and my colleague and officially confirmed friend of 21 years. It's Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? Very, very long time. What I love about it is it sums up our life that the only real way we realise that that had happened is because of a sporting event. Yeah, and not in the galactic scheme of things, a particularly important one. I mean, it was important for Liverpool then, so yes. it was important for you then. But yes. looking back, you know, you've won Champions League since then, you've won league titles since then, it was just the UEFA Cup, but yeah. so most did, people couldn't couldn't care less. I, I, did, I do love that, and then Taib's like, oh, God, do you remember when Michael Owen was good? No, he's a man. Don't don't remember anything that ever happened with Michael Owen. Boring Welsh mank. Harsh, um, harsh but true. Harsh but, you know, just dealing in facts here. Um, the Super Bowl is over, the season is over, Neil. So what we are looking to do this week is review the Super Bowl. We will do our thoughts on many things that are related to the Super Bowl. How much rapping you did at half-time. Have you decided to be upside down during any point this week? We will also look at off-season storylines that we know we will be bored by and we assume that you will be too. We have three each. Um, the problem with the NFL off-season is they f- usually follow a very similar pattern year in, year out. Different names, same concepts. And we will highlight what we will be absolutely bored by within the next few weeks. I mean, it all, you also have to factor in that of all the major sports, it has the longest off-season so there's an awful lot of filler. There was a there was something on 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 the worldwide leads of the day. Someone suggesting that Patrick Mahomes wasn't a top five quarterback. It's time to go to sleep, guys. It's 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 February. Like we don't need these discussions right now. It's no time, not time at all. That's, just yeah. I mean, it was a nice pink suit he had on, but not not today. Not if you're going to wear Satan. a pink suit, yeah, if you're going to wear a pink suit, it's to take the attention away from something you're going to say and do. And unfortunately, it wasn't pink enough to distract yeah. from what he said and did. Absolutely, absolutely. Without further ado, let's get on with the show and let us talk about the Super Bowl. So, Neil, last Sunday Super Bowl. Um, obviously, for those who are under a rock, the Los Angeles Rams beat the Cincinnati Bengals. What are your overall overall thoughts on the game? Well, in what I find myself doing more and more as I proceed through this journey on this thing we call life, I find myself agreeing with something that Matt Kelly says, and that is, I find it reprehensible that the trophy gets handed to the owner. That's been, just so, just so you and Matt are aware, that's been reprehensible. But the, the other 55 times it happens yeah. it should be even more reprehensible than St. Louis native Stan Conkey lifts it for the Los Angeles Rams who he moved from St. Louis stole from St. Louis yes I, I, what I'm going to say I'm going to say yes however you know they, they didn't appear in St. Louis by magic um, they haven't been the St. Louis Rams since 1847 they were stolen by St. Louis from Los Angeles, hence why I use the phrase taken. Yeah, finders keepers. Yeah, um, <laughs> any other tournament of any other sport, I mean, the FA Cup final, the captain doesn't walk up and wait for the bloody chairman to come up so he can lift it up, can he? You say this, but but if you watch the African Cup of Nations, G- Gianni Infantino absolutely wanted to get involved in the Senegal pre- <laughs> celebrations and Kalidou Koulibaly was having absolutely none of it. <laughs> Um, the game itself, I think, I think we could argue that again it followed a similar pattern to the championship games in that there was two coaches here who both looked like they were trying to lose it, and it was going to be who made the last stupid mistake from a coaching point of view would seal the game. Now, obviously, the start of the second half, it looked like the Bengals were going to take over the game, but then. There was a during one random drive after they went up. There was like a flare up on the sideline involving Aaron Donald, and some people think, "Oh, Donald's getting a bit hot headed." To to quote, you know, Bumble in the cricket country, he's ticking. You know, you're thinking he could get himself ejected here. No, he was getting himself angry, and from that point on, 
the Bengals the Bengals already lost. They just didn't know it yet. I think you look at it, and I, I think the game changes, in my opinion, on one play, uh, which is the play where Matthew Stafford weirdly underthrows Odell Beckham Jr., which makes Odell Beckham Jr. hesitate and then basically tear his ACL. For me, before that moment, I expected the Rams to win by 10 to 14 points. I thought it would be quite comfortable. They were dominating the game at that point. Um, once Beckham went out for the subsequent two and a half quarters before the fourth quarter, Sean McVay forgot that he had Cooper Cup on his team and tried desperately not to give it to him. Um, as someone who had thought he'd picked Odell Beckham and when we did silly prop bets, the over and MVP... You know, I you know it's it was disappointing for Beckham to go down. It did affect the game. I think I do. I think both teams are flawed, and that may be a coaching thing in, w- in where they are flawed. I think the roster of the Bengals is top heavy. I think is probably the best way to describe it, and they have a lot of work to do. I think we'll come on to that. Um, I do believe that the best team won that day and that may only just be because Aaron Donald was on that team and I think people would look at the final play where Jalen Ramsey was beat again and and if it wasn't for Aaron Donald destroying Joe Burrow the Cincinnati Bengals were going to win the game but the play is fourth and one Samaji P. Ryan is past Aaron Donald and Aaron Donald grabs him like he's picking his two year old as his two year old's about to run into the road and drags him back it's a phenomenal play and is why he, although I understand why Cooper Cup was MVP because he's an offensive player Aaron Donald was the best player on the field the Rams won the game because they remembered who their best player on offense yeah. was and fed him in the fourth quarter the Bengals knew he was getting the ball it didn't bother them they were going for him the Bengals on offense in the drive that counted in the drive for the Super Bowl went youth football in everyone needs a touch and trusted Samaji Pirine yeah exactly with Jamar Chase T Higgins Tyler Boyd Joe Mixon all these players at your disposal and you decided to give Samaji P. Ryan something to remember in his Super Bowl. And it's not The Bengals are not alone in this, because the Eagles are exactly the same. There's plenty of other teams. Stop giving shit players the ball. Every time... Look, I'll, I'll hop back to the Eagles, because I've got to mention it somehow. Every time the Eagles send a target to a player not called Devonta Smith or Dallas Goddard, it is a win for the opposition. Every time. The Bengals gave the ball to someone other than Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, T. You know Joe Mixon, or Tyler Boyd. It was a win for the Rams. And on fourth and one in the Super Bowl, you decided to give it to Samaji P. Ryan. That's what gets you five-year contract extensions from the Cincinnati Bengals. But make sure you lock up the coach who called that play before you lock up the stud safety. Make sure you do that. If we deep dive a little bit more on the champs. Um, I, I guess how many teams do you think will fail while trying to follow the Rams model of going all in well did you, did you see the shirt that Les Snead was wearing during the Super Bowl parade no uh, it's, it was a picture of his face with um, fuck those picks <laughs> exactly right it's it was a strategy that most Madden players have contemplated at one time or another, you know, trading Everton for 99s and building up, and, and who cares, you'll just trade them up anyway. It's a bold strategy in the era of salary cap. It's not one I think the NFL would want a lot of teams to do. Um, I, I think deep down the NFL hates trades because it thinks, you know, it's they're always worried that one team is going to get screwed and obviously screwed so it will affect the quaint notion of competitive balance it worked for the Rams 
is it a sustainable plan for the Rams or is it one Super Bowl and that's the lot? This is the question because the cap's going up. But seriously, can they afford to pay Von Miller, who's a free agent now, and look like Von Miller again and is going to want to be paid like Von Miller? They're not going to be. They're not going to pay Odell Beckham, and Beckham had probably priced himself out before he got injured. So it's a question of, you know, can they look to run it back with what they've got and hope to hit, you know, hope to hit some home runs later in the draft because they certainly don't care enough about the first first few rounds and they haven't got the picks anyway. Yeah. I don't think there are many teams as bold as Les Snead who do this I think you know I, I just think teams there's, there's this it's not fear but teams value picks so much that they'd rather waste their picks on yeah. their own players and fail that way than blow their entire draft and probably future drafts on other people's established players and run the risk of failing that way because as we all know the NFL wants you to fail their way. They don't need to fail in a new way. You fail the same way everyone else has always failed. Yeah, I mean, this work for the, the LA Rams, and that's cool, but I, I don't think it's a, something you should do. I know you, you, you said, you know, it, it's probably only a one Super Bowl thing. I think we need to, we need to, I keep on saying this, right? The New England Patriots and Tom Brady have normalised regularly making and winning the Super Bowl. That is not normal. Okay? There's been 56 of these fuckers. It's not normal, especially in the salary cap era, right? So, when you're in one, win one. And they did. And they believed with the talent they had. They, If they made moves like Matthew Stafford, like Von Miller... Like Odell Beckham Jr., they could win the Super Bowl, and they have, and you know that's a good thing. And in the in a market like Los Angeles, which is seen as apathetic towards sports unless you win, returning and winning so early is good for that franchise long term. In what can only be described as a unbelievable stadium. In the normalising of um, winning Super Bowls, I want to give you some stats. And this is related to the Cincinnati Bengals. In the last 45 years, 27 quarterbacks have lost at least one Super Bowl. Only four of them have come back to win one later in their career. Tom Brady twice, John Elway and Peyton Manning. In fact, only five quarterbacks in that span have even made it back to the Super Bowl after losing one. Brady went back three times, so did Elway, so did Jim Kelly, so did Peyton, and Kate Warner um, went once. I guess he was after he lost with St. Louis, he went back with Arizona. He did. Dan Marino went to 23 and never went back. Joe Namath went to 25 and never went back. Cam Newton, 26. Aaron Rodgers, 27. Drew Brees, 30. And Steve Young, 33. So please. For the love of God, save me from people saying, oh, well, the Bengals will be back. Because A, whether anybody likes it or not, they are the Cincinnati Bengals. And two, this is really, really hard to get back to the Super Bowl, especially when you look at the gauntlet of quarterbacks that they will have to go through to even get back to that position. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) Every team starts the season 0 and 0. So every team has at the start of the season the same ch- uh, technically the same amount of chance of getting to the Super Bowl. We all know that's not the case. Some teams disqualify themselves through ineptitude, mm. some through the brilliance of others. But we know that all 32 teams do not have an equal chance of getting to the Super Bowl. Whether it's a talent question, whether it's a coaching question, whether it's a front office question, we don't know. As you said, there is a hope for the future that maybe this is going to be a fixture that more and more different matchups will occur. We won't have a, one team going to 15 out of 20, or you know, however many it seems that Tom Brady went to. 
But as you've as we've pointed out on countless occasions now, the AFC is lousy with top tier quarterback talent. You are, it's going to get in a position where you are going you are either going to have to wait for something horrible to happen to another team, or you're going to catch lightning in a bottle yourself and run so pure that you can get past every other team and get there. That's good. We want competitive, you know, a competitive balance. We want to see different teams. This was this was good because this was going to be two teams who hadn't won the Super Bowl while I've been watching the NFL, and I've been watching the NFL for over twenty years. Yeah. So you know, um, so I want to see different teams in it and winning it. We shouldn't just say though that just because all those great quarterbacks went to one and never went back that it's never going to happen for Joe Burrow we shouldn't say that because he's very talented he has a great core of weapons around him you'd hope the team has a plan for how to protect him but that's another issue but we also shouldn't we're not allowed to be surprised if in 15 years Joe Burrow bows out of the NFL and never went back to another one because sport happens and this is tough, and this is what I'm saying. The Patriots and Brady have normalised something that is tremendously difficult. Most important part of the whole event, though, Neil, was the halftime show. That's clear. Um, in shocking news, Snoop Dogg took uh, a hit of weed before he started the show in a place where it's legal to do so, so basically not a story. But I want your thoughts on the halftime show review, because in theory, it was aimed at... Us, quote unquote. Well, if it was aimed at us, it missed. I didn't watch it, and I haven't watched it. How did you not watch it? I was busy. Doing what? It was half time. It, exactly. Yeah. Generally, when it's half time, my attention drifts. Whatever the sport is, you know, whether I'm having lunch, I'm going, for, I'm going to the toilet. I didn't watch it. What a loser! It was amazing. Um, yeah, bravo. Good luck to next year's foes. Um, you're going to say other things. What, what channel did you watch the Super Bowl on then? BBC. Okay, so I watched it on Game Pass, so I got to see all the the um, commercials. So you haven't seen Arnold Schwarzenegger being Zeus or... No? Okay. I've seen any of them. I did get to watch it, say, with um, Nat Nakums hosting the BBC's coverage. I think it's the first time he's done the Super Bowl because usually it's uh, Chappers. Now, the three studio guests they had were Jason Bell, who oh, it literally, he, he, that man is a coat hanger. Whatever he wears looks good on him. OC was bringing, was packing the hardware. He had the two rings on. Of course, and, of course. Um, Effie Obada, the, I think, is it the Panthers? Was he the Bills? Now, they were there. Gentlemen, just all I'm going to say is, you looked fantastic. The chat was great between all, uh, all of you. But my God, man, you can't lean that far back in chairs and not look like you've had a liquid lunch. <laughs> it, it, it was ludicrous. And also, if you're going to lean that far back, the man spreading that was going on, it was, come on. This is, this is, this isn't acceptable. OC, come on. Yeah, I, I, I watched the NBC coverage. So, um, I guess I saw Chris and Al for the final time as they won't be together next year as assumed. Um, I saw the last thing Michelle Defoy had did before she became a weird piece of shit MAGA racist person um, and then I saw a load of uh, adverts which were cool the half time show was amazing ticked all the boxes not really sure why someone said to 50 cent who's probably more now a dollar and a half um, that he should be upside down because it probably didn't do anything for him but you know Dre Snoop Eminem taking a knee, ticked the many boxes for me, and uh, yeah, I wish next year's participants the best of luck in Arizona because they're going to need it because um, they probably won't be as good. The good thing to come out of it, I say, I've not seen it, I've not watched any of it. Is the best thing about it is the right wing seems to have hated it, which means it must have been absolutely fantastic. So, kudos. Excellent, excellent. That's enough on the Super Bowl. Let's get on to the off-season. The off-season starts here, Neil, and we will have, as always, many guests talking draft, talking free agency, talking gibberish. 
we will do weird worlds we will do whatever as we always do at this time of year what we will start with though is we have three storylines each you will do your three i will do mine um, of the off-season storylines that on the 17th of February you know you will be bored but of by the end of the season and probably by the 18th of February so Neil well, by the what, end of the pod. what is your first one the first one is the will they won't they retirement stories of various members of the Los Angeles Rams organization because apparently Sean McVay doesn't want to coach into his 60s so that must mean he's going to retire after the Super Bowl at 36. Aaron, at 36, yeah. Um, Aaron Donald saying, you know, don't never say never, and then drunkenly demanding, run it back at the, at the carnival. I don't care. Imagine being that drunk, but I haven't, like, if you... Okay, a different question. If you are Aaron Donald, how often do you wear a top? If I'm Aaron Donald, I don't own tops. That's what I'm saying, I, right? I, I go off a coin toss before on. game. Pre-game, coin toss, it's me, no top. Coin toss, then put top on. Make play in defence, take top off. When offence is on field, I'm permanently just... Get onto this. Yeah. They're not going... I can't see... I can't see Sean McVay retiring. And even if Sean McVay retires, quote-unquote, it's not retiring, is it? It's sabbatical. Because it'll do the, you know... Dick Vermeil, John Gruden, come back that, ten years later. Me, job. The thing that worries me about McVeigh is because obviously they're all saying that you know that he would, he'd be able to go and make a fortune as a broadcaster. Of course. From watching him in like you know All or Nothing or Hard Knocks, I imagine he'd get on everyone's tits within the first half of Week One. See, you he'd be like Sean, calm down. You, you do say that, but you did the podcast on the Ringer and a. Ring in that way with Peter Schrager, um, flying coach, and he is a bit rah rah, but he seems to have loads of mates. Like, do you know, like, you think, oh my god, shut the fuck up, but people seem to like him. So, I understand what you're saying because when he, he does come across as like, give it a rest, can you have decaf? But it does, seem, it does seem that people, you know, like him. I'm sure they do. Actually, in a podcast situation where it's you know a bit more relaxed, we can sit down. You've probably got a, cof- a cup of coffee going. But in a, can you imagine him call you know calling uh, you know doing play by doing the color analysis of an exciting two minute offense? He'd be he'd be on the ceiling. You, know, it you imagine like Tony Romo can get excited, but even Tony you know has something internally that says, "All right, take it down a bit." I don't think McVeigh does. I think he lit, we we talked about you know Josh Allen with the blue smarties phenomenon. That's yeah. what McVeigh would be like, I think. And it'd be like, Sean, you've got to calm down. I love it, love it. Neil, what is your second story that you're already sick of? Um, well, I, I think it's it's one that we it's been building up for a couple of seasons, but just seems the last year and now it's really kicking into overdrive, and that's the quarterback carousel. You know, oh, will they? Won't they? Is is such a person like going to be traded for? I hear rumours. Fuck off! That you know, that Washington might be prepared to give up a first round for Jimmy Garoppolo. Kyler Murray is upset with the Cardinals because he they want him to show more leadership. You know, Carson Wentz may be traded or cut before May the fifteenth. The Eagles might trade Jalen Hurts and a fourth round pick for Russell Wilson the first. Shut up, everyone! Shut up. We haven't even had the draft. The combine hasn't started yet. The combine's going to be worse because this is when the trades are put in place. This is when all that bollocks starts. I'm already up to here. As a team, as a fan of a team who may have one foot on the carousel thinking, do I really want to ride this again? I'm already bored of it. Already bored of it. These teams can't officially talk to anyone and probably haven't, and I'm already fed up to the eyeballs of it. The ironic thing is, you, you didn't mention Aaron Rodgers. Um, but, yeah, it's. There's going to be a lot of it, though. And I think, I think what happened with Matthew Stafford and the year before with Tom Brady does not help that situation, right? Because obviously other things happen for both of those teams, but 
all the people see is these teams didn't have a quarterback, then they did have a quarterback, then they made the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl. So if you so if you think you're a quarterback away, that that this becomes the issue. That, you know, I, I just hope you know the that story of the commanders um, suggesting that you know the think the thing of giving their eleventh pick for Jimmy Garoppolo is just. I know, I know. Football guy will tell me all he does is win games, and that's you know true. But he, I've watched him play, and he can't throw. Um, it's an issue for me. Um, the Carson Wentz thing is patently hilarious. Um, you barely got, you barely giving away your first round pick before deciding that you don't like him anymore, with good reason because he's not very good. Um, Somehow deciding that you would rather stand by Cliff Kingsbury than Kyler Murray is an interesting thought experiment. Um, Russell Wilson is a th- is an interesting thought experiment, and we haven't got to Aaron, Aaron Rodgers, right? Or there could be a lot. Watson. Or Deshaun Watson, yeah. Which that one's that one's very. Maybe it's just me. That one's very noisy, considering we're still in exactly the same position we were when no one talked about it, which is there are criminal proceedings and no one should be doing anything until they are dealt with. See, the fact that there are criminal proceedings and you know it's an ongoing issue that the NFL seems to be wanting to ignore just leads me to think that he's destined to be traded to Washington, where there are other ongoing criminal proceedings and the NFL would rather pretend they that, you know like to ignore it. What's what's wrong with scandal scumbag in the building? This ongoing things of a similar nature, and it also seems that it's not just um, it's not just Washington within the NFC East that have similar thought processes on females and how they should be treated based on a two point four million dollar settlement by the Dallas Cowboys. Men what the hell are these men? Are the worst? Absolutely the worst. But by all means. Call out Mina Kimes for saying that Jimmy Garoppolo can't throw. <laughs> exactly right, exactly. Neil, your final, final storyline you're bored of. It seems like only yesterday it ended, but I speak for a generation of people who were jaded by the annual Favre retirement watch. It was actually 12 years ago that he actually retired. So I have zero interest in Tom Brady pulling this bullshit as well you've said you've retired you've given your reasons for retiring now do us all a favour, piss off go and do whatever it is that you're going to be ridiculously successful at you handsome bastard but get out of the zeitgeist and do not keep this crap going, we're not interested you are only delaying your own Hall of Fame induction go away no but See, I, I agree with you that we're not interested, i.e. me and you, but the world is, and that's a problem. The world is a problem. <laughs> well, there's that too. But I think the thing is, is what we sometimes forget is, is, is because of how he was usually portrayed in New England, we forget that Tom Brady, much like every quarterback, especially successful and especially that successful, is a fucking egomaniac who loves attention and winning and people fawning over him. And do you know what? The best way to do that is to retire and then, you know, show a little leg about coming back. Ask Brett Favre. He did it for fucking 15 years. Um, It will be boring. I don't think he comes back personally, but... I do think they like seeing his name in light in stories on, you know, sports centre. I have said on countless occasions on this podcast and on others that I've been lucky enough to be invited on that I had no desire to see Tom Brady at the end of his career throwing wounded ducks, looking like a statue, getting hit and needing to be carried off the field. If he comes back after retiring, I will retract that statement and hope he throws pick six after pick six, whichever team he comes back for. Go away. I want to watch the, the NFL without you. This is my first chance to do so. Stop ruining it for me, Tom. Go away. 
Um, I'm going to go on to my off-season storylines that I'm sure to be bored of. And my first one is a classic. It's a draftism. And it's quarterback hand size. Oh. oh my god! You know when you live in a world where a 23-year-old human is refusing to have his hands measured at the senior bowl because he's double jointed and doesn't believe they will do it properly because he's got small hands and that means that it could affect his draft stock is ugh. now I know and I understand that there is a prototypical size for each body part when it comes to quarterback but I'm just not interested in oh well can he pick it well he, you know he, he's got small hands so his hand size is an issue you know what happens when he plays in cold conditions Kenny Pickett played four years at the University of fucking Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh player, Heinz Field, you know, the outdoor stadium in Pittsburgh. For those who are unaware, college games take place around the same time as the NFL. I dot E dot, the winter. So he's been okay. It'll be fine. Yeah, it's part of the draft is it is it's a tradition that we've all come to acknowledge and enjoy to an extent. But there is still something slightly indecent about the amount of attention we pay to these young men in their underpants and regarding certain parts of their anatomy. Now, you can t- you know I will I, we when we speak to Mr. Schofield, which hopefully will be in a few weeks. Yeah, he can tell us all about why it's so important that a hand has to be a certain size but as I'm not a QB expert I will never be mistaken for one and I will never try and pretend to be one I couldn't give a shiny shit um, let's, let's move on to another draftism that I'm, I'm tremendously tremendously bored by team in top 5 and people tell me you know what they should do trade down to get more picks yeah, it's that easy. Fucking yeah, right? Oh well, why did you not tell anybody that before? Because then everybody would have done it. Like, no shit, Sherlock. Two picks is better than one pick. Thanks for that. But you know what? Teams don't like giving away picks, as Neil quite rightly pointed out earlier. So therefore, don't bore me with the idea of a oh, well. If I was the, if I was the GM of the Jacksonville Jaguars, I'd probably trade down from one to like five and get three more picks. First of all. Who the fuck is someone picking at one? As Mark Schofield will quite rightly point out to us, none of these quarterbacks are actually any good in in or perceived as good. So guess what? No one's coming up for a quarterback of five. So you know, the, get over it. The illegitimate love child of just trade down is of course team A will listen to offers for first overall <laughs> yeah, of pick. Course. Of course they will. Unfortunately, Mike Dicker has been out of the NFL for nearly 20 years and no one's offering their full draft for a running back anymore. That's the only draft, that's the only you know talks I would listen to. So, yeah, we know they should trade down. Unfortunately, if everyone knows they should trade down, who's trading up? Which mug is going to say, I know you want to trade down. You know, tell you what, we can negotiate now in March to trade up or we can wait till draft day when you're more desperate to do it and we might do it and we won't give you as much. I know what I'd do. Final story, Neil, and it's one of my favourites every single year. Can't wait for someone to tell me how everybody needs to keep an eye on those Dallas Cowboys because they've got the talent to go all the way this year. They've had the talent to go all the way last year and the year before and the year before that and the year before that um, they never do maybe maybe there's a reason for that um, maybe they're not as talented as everybody thinks they are and also they've got Mike McCarthy as their head coach I consider myself lucky because you know how on Twitter you can mute certain words or phrases yes I've trained my brain to mute everything that comes out about the Dallas Cowboys. They're irrelevant. 
you know how I know they're irrelevant? Because they don't do anything in the playoffs. So I don't care. They're literally shouting into the void as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, they will be. I mean, I've already seen the Super Bowl odds for next year because I wrote up on, uh, wrote up about them for number five. Of course. St- stunningly, I think they're sixth favourite, which is, you know, it's where you have to put a team that haven't been to a title game since 1995. It's, you know, that's the type of respect they deserve for one playoff win in, you know, five years with the is he third highest paid quarterback in the NFL with a single playoff victory in a game where he didn't have to do anything because Seattle refused to stop running the ball. No, no, that's that's great. You 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 give them the respect they deserve. I don't care. So, you know, I, I know, you know, you're you have a more long standing hatred of the Cowboys than I do. But I have the advantage that while I've been watching it, they have been irrelevant. Yeah, and I care. Not... I care for them as much as I care for the Detroit Lions. It's not that. It's just they are continually. I'm continually told that they will be good this year. Like, be good then. Like, you know, if you're good, I can still hate you, but I'm okay with that, right? You're good, fine. But like, be good then. Yeah. That's I'm, all I'm, I'm saying. More than, yeah, more than happy to see teams crowned Super Bowl champions in June. More than happy to see it. Yeah. Once the real game start, you know. As you know, as many people have said, when someone shows you their true colours, believe them. And when the you know when the bullets start flying, they show their true colours. They're gutless and can't do it in the big stage. I'm happy with that. Amazing, amazing. That is it. The season is officially over, and we are in off-season mode. Won't be weekly, probably bi-weekly, dependent on guests, dependent on storylines. We will talk free agency. We will talk draft. We will talk to our favourite people who we regularly talk to every year to get their thoughts on the season and the season to come. Neil, before we sign off for 2021, which it is uh, Washington um, Commanders, just so you know, it's the, the the Rams didn't win the Super Bowl in 22. They won the 21 season, just, just so you're aware. Um, where can people catch you over the next few weeks, Neil? Over the next few weeks, the best place is to, fo- is to follow me on Twitter at Nutton13. Haven't written an awful lot. I did do a piece on who will be the first quarterback taken in the draft. That was for number five. Led me down a something of a of a wormhole. I didn't expect to have to be looking up the passing statistics for the Houston, ba- Houston Baptist Huskies. And unfortunately, if that's when you want to learn about Bailey Zappe, that's where you have to go. So, yeah, find that on number five. Follow me on Twitter at Nutton13. I will tweet out any other stuff I write. Awesome. Um, I was travelling to Bristol, but the Touchdown Boys did a touchdown review without me. Therefore, I assume I am now redundant. Although they did need me to post the show, so maybe not. Silent producer, maybe going forward. Um, they talked Super Bowl. They talked Half Time Show. Fantastic show. Give it a listen. I am at Mainz7. As Neil said, he is at end up in 13. Combine we are at waxing underscore lyrical. Another spectacular season from the NFL and an absolutely mediocre set of podcasts from me and Neil. But would you expect anything else? On that note, these top guys are out. We'll be back soon. But thank you for the season. <laughs>